it's funny, everybody s says to me, you must be mad to run an open air season in England and the weather's so terrible. The weather isn't that terrible. I think the new Shakespeare company now has um, a firmly established reputation as presenting popular Shakespeare. And nothing pleases me more than to hear members of the audience who come and say, well, quite honestly, I didn't want to come, but they said the park's nice, and go out and say, I didn't know Shakespeare could be like that. I, I loved it. I first auditioned for this company in 1971, and I was lucky enough to get the part of Bottom, which I was thrilled to do, because it sounds cliche, but that was my ambition, to play that part, and so I played it quite early on in my career. Hi, Ian. How are you? Hi. Frozen. How are you? There's only three of us in the office during the winter. That's Hilary, my assistant, and Robert, who's the administrator. And then this side of Christmas, uh, it really gets, it hots up. This year, I've had about 2,000 CVs for about 28 jobs, which is quite daunting. The phone rings a lot, and all the agents say, how are you, as if we've only just spoken. And then once I've cast the season, um, they forget about me for nine months again. Quince, come on. I usually do an inspection of the theatre on a Monday morning, just to see if everything's all right. The odd tree sometimes falls down. It calms you down somehow. You've come through the traffic on Marylebone Road and you suddenly think, no, I'm in the middle of the country and it's a pleasure to be working here. Quince! My four-legged friend here is called Quince, who six years ago nearly starved to death and was thrown over the railings. But a member of the company <laughs> happily saved him and you can see how lively he is now. He's very friendly, adores the theatre. He did audition for The Dream one year, but I wouldn't have him in it because he distracted from the company. He barked so much. There are 1,185 seats, but also there's a great tradition here of sitting on the, on the grass bank and um, with a really full house. And the, the grass bank's full, uh, 1,300 is the most we can get in. Now, in, before we built this new auditorium, one could get another uh, two or three hundred uh, in, in the old days, but uh, that was not really satisfactory, way out on park seats sitting at the side. Robert Atkins had been the director of the theatre, which had been founded in 1932. Atkins finished here in 1960, and we started in 1962. Uh, a lot of the uh, actors, actresses here became film stars. Vivian Lee worked here. Um, she played Anne Boleyn in Henry VIII. Apparently her voice was rather, rather small, so the park uh, didn't really quite suit her. Anna Neagle played Rosalind. Uh, Greg Arson, Deborah Carr started here. There's a huge list. This season we're presenting A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which is our most popular play, but we didn't do it last year, followed by Hamlet, which we've never done here before, uh, followed by the musical The Card, which is based on Arnold Bennett's novel. Deborah Page has been receiving excellent notices for her work at the Salisbury Playhouse, where she is the artistic director. And I phoned up for her availability, and she came and chatted with me, and I loved her ideas on the dream. And she was mad about doing a production in the open air, which seemed quite a good reason to ask her to do one here. What I need to do as a director is, is get a sense of where's comfortable and, and where the strong movement lines are for actors. And sometimes the best way to do that is simply get up there and do it yourself. And this stage in particular has got a wonderful feeling because you've, you can just sort of stand there just about a little way back and, and see exactly where the audience is and feel what the relationship's about. I don't think I've ever directed anything professionally in the open air at all, so this is my first experience. And um, I, I just find myself wondering what all the problems are. But also, it's terribly exciting because it presents all sorts of ideas and opportunities.
you never know what's going to happen for any two performances. One season, there, were, there was a, a mother duck and about four ducklings who made an appearance nearly every matinee and used to walk down the side bank and walk across. Um, and I thought that was delightful. I could always remember on the first night that suddenly two herons arrived in a huge tree, which it's, it's now come down that tree, on stage right and uh, uh, started copulating, which made a tremendous noise. Everyone tried to pretend they were tremendous Shakespeare buffs and it was very hard to keep your eyes on the stage. So those are some of the, uh, the problems we have being close to nature. mirrors at the back now and they're scaled down and they're scaled down now. that's right that's so much better because now it hits that yeah proud proportions better isn't it and there's the moon, <laughs> <laughs> there's the moon. Oh, God. when i was working with geraldine pilgrim who is a designer oh, i've yes. known for a while yeah. we, we both got very excited about the idea of how you could make um a very ordered world into a wild world without actually having to change the set. Yeah. And, and so what we decided to do is to set it, partly because it's in Regent's Park here, in an estate in a parkland that had a sort of boundary and got locked at night, if you like. We wanted to somehow pick up the atmosphere of some of the buildings around Regent's Park, which are very sort of classic, very ordered, yet they have a certain sort of lightness and fantasy about them. When I was at school, which is when I first got excited about theatre, we used to um, always do plays outside every summer. And, and it was part of, part of life, really, the best part of life for me. just for a minute um, for first of all welcome uh, I'm absolutely devoted to the open-air theatre and I first worked here in 1971 and each time I think can we do it again and it seems to me that we've got the vibes going for the most successful season yet it's a, a wonderful place to work I'm really thrilled to have such a strong company I'd like you to raise your glasses and toast the 1994 season and I wish you every success so through the 1994 season Really, when you think about it, there is no space in London that is more like the way the plays were originally performed than this particular theatre. So I I'm really looking forward to getting down to it. It's a less glamorous and a less finger up your ass, Kleinborn, I think. Um, that, that's, the, that's the idea, I think. I think that's the general idea. Come and relax in the sun and see, see some wonderful romantic comedy, which is ideal for the romantic setting provided by the part like A Midsummer Night's Dream. I want to talk a bit about the play, although I'm wary of saying too many things about it, because I think it's about all of our imaginations and the audience's imaginations, and it's about magic, and if we tread too heavily on it, we'll squash it along with those fairies underfoot. Um, so I think However much you want to think it out in advance, the real business happens when you, when you get everybody together in one room and, and start the process of seeing what the chemistry of all those people's imaginations does when it comes together. Because it's always a sort of two-way process. I don't think I ever say, right, this is the way I'm going to do it, so this is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, it, it works the other way as well, that you meet people and you think, oh, I hadn't quite thought of it being like that, but wouldn't that work rather well? Um, and the play about, is about a play, it's about acting, it's about imagination, it's about making plays work, um, and it's about the audience. OK. 
Okay, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got the luxury of having five fairies who don't have to play anything else, and so they can concentrate on being fairies. Um, and they are so completely important to this play, and so, so absolutely integral to the play, that the first thing I want to make them do is not feel as if they're bit players on the edge who come in every now and again to say lines which, when you read them on the page, look as if they were designed for the average six-year-old to say. What I think I want to get to is what, what fairies are, what can they do that other people can't do, what is their lifespan like? Um, and, and what I want to do is just try some ideas out without talking about it. I'd like to get them thinking about what sort of sounds they can make, like slightly sort of the equivalent of ultrasonic sound. Um, but, but we must be able to hear it, and they must be able to hear it. It's sort of rasping noises that um, insects make by rubbing their legs together, all those sort of sound qualities, which, again, which actors can do very well and, and give a sense that there is something odd going on here. Now I see what you can do. I'm perfect. I can do what With I like. putting your head up and down. I can do almost what I like. And I, everything I except can. you can't see? Yes, I can. Oh, through here? I think I've caught your cold. Or oh, someone's cold. But it's best to have it now, oh, than yeah, yeah. two weeks' time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <clears> no! <throat> right. All right. All done? Great. Great. Yes, Sarah. What about the ears? You're right. Well, it's a little, it, it's a little bit constricting. It's not as constricting as some of the other heads I tried on. But then, that's what I want. I mean, I, it actually gives me a fix. So I want what I wanted was a mask, and uh, it means I've got to, I've got to use the, the shape of the head. I see no blood, no wound. Lysander. If you live good, sir, awake. And run through fire, I will, for thy sweet sake. And sometimes you're lucky and you'll get Hamlet all day. Sometimes Midsummer Night's Dream. Sometimes you get Hamlet in the morning, Midsummer Night's Dream in the afternoon, and then a little bit more Hamlet. So it can get a bit higgledy-piggledy. Where is Demetrius? Oh, half. Well, as long as you've got a lunch break, it's OK, but sometimes you literally run from one room to another and that can be a bit confusing. But they're such different plays, do you know what I mean? Ophelia is very different from Helena. Although they're both knocked around a bit by their boyfriends. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Hamlet's quite a claustrophobic, intense, moody play. Um, and it's a tragedy. <laughs> and um, it's my extreme as a comedy. So they're very, very different. It is very hard work. It's quite, quite emotionally tiring. In heaven and earth, we are Aaron's names all! wonders at our quaint spirits. Then to your offices and let me rest.
happened? What's happened? Jesus What's gone, gone wrong? Have you got there anything? Jason, anything? can you just check what power is there? Right. To see if there's so anything think, we can do. So we think we've probably got about a third of yeah, we've got one face. So we could just look at light. some of it, couldn't so we? I don't know which mm -hmm. lights they are. Well, have a go. Yeah. Uh, Jason, could you tell us exactly what's happened tonight? <laughs> well, uh, we're not entirely sure. We started plotting the lighting and we did Q1 and uh, and Deborah and everybody came up to uh, have a look and there was a funny smell coming from behind <laughs> me uh, and uh, I said to Jason, the other Jason, that uh, I think there's something wrong here and we turned around and there was smoke pouring out of one of the fuse boxes and we've been left with about 10 circuits out of 60. How many days are there until the first public performance? Oh, not many now, where are we? Tuesday, so we've got three days. Um, three full days, but the end of the third day we're on. Saturday I was supposed to see a run-through and couldn't, so everything's conspiring <laughs> against me really. I haven't seen a run-through. I've focused under an umbrella and I know the power's gone. I think until the very last moment, truthfully, you always do think that you've got enough time. Um, and even when things go perfectly, in my experience in theatre, you run out of time. Everyone would be immensely cheered up by a quick dose of sunshine at the moment. That's all we need. Mm. about to happen. Terrified. <laughs> Absolutely terrified. Yeah. Here's your drink. Thanks. Here's to the season. Good luck. God help us all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My mother appeared as one of the fairies in Midsummer Night's Dream. She only got the sack because during the dance she turned off her lights. So it was a big black hole in the, <laughs> in the group. It's a great place to work, wonderful. The best bit of this working here is when the light fades at about, I don't know, nine o'clock tonight, and then it is magic. Kindly take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. This evening's performance is about to begin. Thank you. Maris, just to check, we're not doing the moon in Act One, yes? It moved exactly as yesterday. Okay, thank you. The moon's in. Okay. The moon's in. Sorry. Uh, well, why? No, hang on, because I just plotted it out this afternoon. Can you find it on a fader? Uh, Jason is in big trouble. Go around the outside and get it quicker. House lights and Sam Q1. Go. I didn't like that bit. Moon. 
go. start to rain even if you paid the top price you're all in it together and that's why I firmly believe it should always remain an open-air theatre and some people have said why don't you have a roof and I think that would destroy it because that's what we are that's you sit there and you look up at the stars and the moon and that's the magic of it what? Well, thou hear some music my sweet love I have a reason of the good air and music Let's have the tongs and the booze. <laughs> when Oberon and Titania come together on a balmy still evening and birds fly overhead. There's nothing like it. You cannot believe you're sitting in the middle of London. And the owner of it blessed ever shall in safety rest. Took away, let no stay. Meet me all by break of day. 